Once an incident has happened, we've gone through uh, the stages of detection and analysis, um, we come to the area of reporting. And this is really important not only for reporting in terms of statutory obligations, uh, potentially for breach, um, breach incident notifications, for example, but also for understanding internally what happened, communicating about that incident and knowing what to do in terms of remediation and preventing it from happening in future. So reports will be made on an ongoing basis, um, giving the current status of the re report of the incident, uh, giving a summary, uh, indicators related to the incident. So those are indicators of compromise, which might actually um, be things like malware hashes, um, files that are associated with the URLs, IP addresses that malware is contacting, um, contacting or um, communicating with. Uh, if somebody has, has actually breached the network, uh, the IP addresses that they came in from, uh, what, what they attacked, etc. The actions taken all by all of the incident handlers on the incident is important. Chain of custody, if applicable. Uh, impact assessments related to the incident, what's happened, um, what is the consequences of that. Contact information for other involved parties, you know, the people who, the business owners, system owners, administrators, etc third-party organizations that may be helping with the incident, a list of the evidence gathered during the investigation, comments from the incident handlers, and next steps to be taken. And that may be the remediation or rebuilding of hosts. So I've mentioned indicators of compromise before, um, and these are pieces of forensic data that identify a malicious attack. So they include um, unusual, outbound usually, but not necessarily always, network traffic. So data exfiltration, for example, can lead to surges of traffic that are uh, leaving the network. In fact, uh, when the census was run, um, not this year, but the um, prior census in Australia, uh, one of the reasons that that was shut down uh, was on the belief that there was data exfiltration going on. They saw a spike in traffic and they were worried that somebody had hacked them uh, and was exfiltrating data. And it turned out to be an anomaly, um, but it costed, cost the census a 24-hour period of uh, uh, being down and inoperative and uh, inaccessible to the uh, people trying to take the census. This year it seemed to have gone without a hitch. Anomalies in privileged account behavior is another uh, indicator of compromise. Geographic irregularities, logins from new locations and countries, network traffic from specific IP addresses, unusual database activity, uh, presence of malware of other files, and signs of DDoS attacks. Um, obviously, things like ransomware, as I mentioned before, um, are pretty obvious once your files have been encrypted and locked. Uh, but even DDoS attacks, um, where you're getting unusually high request volumes coming in and everything slowing down. Typically, there are MD5 hashes of malware, IP addresses, and URLs of domain names of botnets, etc., that are the um, sort of the IOCs that most people concern themselves with. Tactics, techniques and procedures um, are important in the, the whole process of incident management because um, they can help to identify potentially the groups that are involved. Uh, so just to reiterate what these are, uh, tactics are high level overall objectives of an attacker split into the phases of the kill chain. The techniques are the next level down and describe the general behavior to achieve the tactical objective and then procedures of specific instances of behaviors to carry out a technique using particular software. Um, and we talk about uh, TTPs in response to uh, response, um, and we talk about TTPs uh, in reference to particular threat actor groups um, because of this notion of what's called the pyramid of pain. And 
It's thought that TTPs uh, are the hardest thing to change uh, because uh, so much investment in actually developing the techniques and procedures to actually meet an objective that threat actor groups um, very rarely change these as compared to th other IOCs like URLs and IP addresses which can be changed relatively easily. So um, an example of a tactics technique and procedure might be, um, for example, initial access might be the tactic. Um, so we're trying to gain initial access to a network. The technique might be involved scanning that network and a procedure would be scanning the network using Nmap. And so you can see that we go from sort of the broad abstract, um, abstract notion of this down to the more specific with the tactics, techniques and procedures or TTPs. So this is the pyramid of pain um, that I just alluded to. Uh, it was camp uh, the idea was uh, first proposed in 2013 by David Bianco. So at the bottom, you have hash values of files, which are trivial to change because you can change one byte in the file and it will change the hash. IP addresses are relatively easy. Domain names that the attackers might have registered are simple. Changing networks and computers um, and infrastructure like that is harder and more annoying. But ch ch changing tools and TTPs um, become very difficult uh, and part of partly because of the investment in terms of time and money to develop or acquire those tools and de develop the skills and procedures to be able to actually use them to carry out attacks. I mentioned the um, difficulty in attributing attacks to particular um, threat groups when I talked about hackback. Uh, attribution is uh, actually very hard but it's supposed to help because it reveals the motivations and objectives of the attackers so that that can help you potentially stop the progression of an attack and also it can potentially sort of help in understanding the impact of the attack if you know that a particular threat group uh, are usually involved in espionage for example then knowing that um, you're being attacked by that group can then focus your attention to you know, what assets have been potentially compromised. If it's crime, then obviously uh, that becomes a lot easier. With ransomware, attribution is normally not that difficult, not that it helps very much um, because the uh, particular groups identify themselves explicitly uh, or they do things in a very specific way, in which case they can be identified from either the malware they're using the notes they leave or the, the approach that they take, for example, exfiltrating data before uh, encrypting all the, de the disks and then threatening to uh, post that data onto the dark web. So the MITRE attack framework we've mentioned um, previously uh, is based entirely on the premise that if you uh, attribute that you can gain advantages from this. So it contains information about 110 different groups that um, various security researchers have identified. Uh, with these groups, they're all named uh, in a particular way and each security organization will name them differently. Some are, are named after animals, um, others are named after elements. Um, so it depends on the company involved or the organization. So the problem with MITRE ATT&CK is that when you look at the actual distribution and uniqueness of the TTPs, uh, it's very hard to actually uh, get a unique set of TTPs for a particular group. You would have to discover more than four uh, of these techniques uh, to be able to identify uh, potentially a group of these groups and uh, the number of techniques that you have to identify increases to be able to, with a, you know, sort of certainty, identify a group. Also, one of the problems with attribution is that it's subject to the concept of false flags. Um, a false flag is where uh, a, an attacker 
will make it look like the attack came from another group. So it's very easy once you know that, let's say for example, um, Australia is hacking New Zealand and you know they always do things in a certain way, then if another country um, uh, or state you know, wanted to hack New Zealand and place the blame uh, on Australia, they could just use the same tools, to same tactics, techniques and procedures and then um, basically point the finger at uh, Australia. So, and that's called a false flag operation. Key thing, um, attribution is hard. So we get to this concept of incident containment, um, eradication and recovery. The first challenge in containment is to stop further impact and that may, be, that may involve disabling accounts, blocking network traffic, or isolating a computer or segment of the network. In the case of WannaCry, for example, uh, one of the ways of actually stopping further impact was the discovery of a kill switch that the malware was operating on, in which it was checking that a certain host um, or a certain domain name had been registered, and it would just try and do a, a DNS lookup. And once it found that domain, then it would stop functioning. And just by registering that domain, um, a security researcher was able to stop the progression of WannaCry until the attackers changed the name. When looking at doing containment, however, you've got to balance that against the potential damage to and theft of resources, um, need for evidence preservation, and uh, not uh, taking things offline. Uh, and this is probably one of the major reasons why organizations end up in a worse state than um, they were before because they wait too long before they make a decision about shutting things down. Time and resources needed is another problem that needs to be balanced with uh, strategies. Effectiveness of the strategy, there's not much point in shutting down computers if um, essentially they've all been infected and um, the spread has uh, happened um, before you've actually shut it down. Uh, also looking at how long that's going to be unavailable for, for example, is an issue. And uh, finally, alerting the attackers. Sometimes you do not want the attackers to know that you've found them because you want to collect more evidence. Um, and so keeping, uh, not doing anything that might sort of alert them about the, their discovery um, is a uh, potentially a good a bonus. Um, as I mentioned, malware uh, may detect attempts to disable it and then take actions based on that. So um, it's one of these things where even taking an action can have an impact on the behaviors of the attackers making it worse. Um, and so it, you need to be careful and also constant monitoring to see what happens. So recovery may involve rebuilding computers or recovering from backups. Um, the essential element, however, is that you have to ensure that all malware is removed and you may want to update accounts. So getting users to reset passwords, for example, and that's quite common if there's been a breach, is to essentially flick a switch and make all users change their password on the next login. Post-incident, what we need to do is uh, review the incident and determine what lessons have been learned. Uh, we may need to notify appropriate authorities that a breach has occurred, and that will depend on the legislation in uh, various countries and obligations. Uh, you may have to notify effective users and follow up with them. Uh, engage with companies around reputation management uh, although it has to be said that uh, a lot of these breaches uh, cause a sensation at the time, but um, it's been my experience that they haven't really caused very much lasting damage to brands of the organisations involved. Even the Australian government has recovered from things like um, robo um, debt and uh, the census fail. Um, and uh, we now sort of still trust them to do things properly. 
despite their handling of previous systems and incidents. Uh, we might need to deal with insurance claims. And in fact, if there's an incident, the insurance company may have got involved at an early stage and providing the uh, advice and planning and also funding of um, incident response. And then there's the analysis of incident data, which is important.